can I kick off and start the question? Um, and the, the question that I'd like to start with is, you know, is the universe eternal? Let me, first of all, perhaps, Brian, you'd like to define why that's important as a question. It's, it's a good question. And the very short answer is we don't know. That's a surprising thing to say, though, because what we do know is that 13.8 billion years ago, the universe was very, very different indeed to the universe that we see today. So today we see this universe full of stars and planets and galaxies, complex structures. What we know is that as you wind time backwards and you go back 13.8 billion years, there were no stars, no planets, no galaxies. The universe was very hot and very dense. And we call that moment, if you like, in the history of the universe, the Big Bang. And it's right. always been synonymous with the origin of the universe, I think, in most people's minds. And and indeed, that's that's the way that... that so hold um, on. Einstein... Was it like a state, the Big Bang? Because what you're saying sounds like it was a state, not an event. Well, that's it. That's the, the key point. So so we we used to think that... Uh, well, I should if I rewind a bit. The framework that we use is Einstein's theory of general relativity. It's published in 1915. That theory strongly suggests that the universe is not... Um, stable in the sense that it should be expanding or contracting. And Einstein actually resisted that. So the theory is really strongly suggesting that space itself should be stretching or shrinking, depending on how much stuff is in it. And most people at the time, I think, Einstein included, thought that the universe should be eternal because it just feels better. You know, you don't have to deal with thorny issues about a moment of creation or the origin or what caused the universe to come into existence, or whatever right, you want to say. Right. Is that not so a I think many, Well, um, many people thought, well, it's a good question, isn't it? So we'll, we'll get to that. So <laughs> mo I think most people kind of thought it was eternal. Um, although, obviously, the, then you have various religions with creation myths and so on. But Einstein's theory strongly suggests that it should be changing. Then the observations in the 1920s by people like Edwin Hubble showed that the universe is indeed stretching, right? The fabric of the universe itself is stretching. The universe is expanding. That caused people like Georges Lemaitre, who was one of the founding sort of sure. founders of cosmology. He was a very interesting man, actually, a Belgian priest as well as a physicist and a, a mathematician. Cool. Caused him to say that it seems the universe had a day without a yesterday. Because if you just imagine, if the universe is expanding today, then that means yesterday everything was closer together and you can rewind time until everything's on top of each other. And we call that the Big Bang. So that's kind right. of what you learn in school, right? And that's the, the basic sort of picture we have of cosmology. But whether or not that time when the universe was hot and dense is indeed a day without a yesterday, if that's a first moment, or whether the universe existed in some other form before that, and indeed, whether that other form goes into the infinite past is just not known. Um, I should say we strongly suspect the universe was in existence before it got hot and dense. And that, that's a theory called inflation, which is essentially sure. the idea that the universe was empty and cold pretty much before the hot Big Bang and expanding very rapidly indeed. And that expansion drew to a close. All the energy driving that expansion was kind of dumped into space, which heated it up and made the particles out of which we're made. But when that began, or if that began, honestly, we don't know. So I struggle with my limited brain to take on the idea of infinity. Like what you're saying, it's always been there. That just doesn't sit with me. Well, I don't know. Firstly, I don't know whether it's always yeah. been there, but nobody does. <clears throat> yeah. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because... Uh, the universe having an infinite future, which we think, again, it probably may well have, um, at the, that, that doesn't seem to bother us as much. I don't know whether it bothers you as much. Yeah, it's completely like symmetric. The emotion is more hopeful. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's fine. And then not knowing where I began, I'm slightly like less comfortable. I'm like, oh, okay, so what? I guess... I guess I'm looking for meaning. You're looking for meaning, right? Like, well, why are we here? I think I, that's a you know I mean? very important um, point, actually. If you, you think about that question, what, what does it mean to be human? It doesn't sound like a scientific question. Yeah. But in fact, what I would argue is that science provides a, the, the words are necessary but not sufficient um, framework 
In, in other words, if we're going to approach that question, it is necessary to know that there are two trillion galaxies in the observable universe. The universe is at least 13.8 billion years old. Uh, the Earth formed four and a half billion years ago. Uh, there are 400 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. All those things are necessary to, to, to try and answer that question, but they're not enough on their own. And I think that's it's a really important part about points about the way that science fits in to culture, right. and to our right. culture and our civilization, because you can't address deep questions without it. Mm. But that's not to say that it will answer all your deep questions. I think that's a question of relevance, mm. is that the, our place on Earth, albeit time-based, or at least we think it's to physically time-based, um, you know, it, maybe our, our you know, maybe our soul goes somewhere or whatever, but we, we're concerned about what we don't know in as much that it might affect what we currently have today. Whereas if we were to wind forward a thousand years, I think most people are thinking, well, it doesn't really matter because it's not as relevant because I'm not going to be participating in that, that journey. Um, do, do you think? Because, you know, legacy is something that, that many people feel they want to leave. They want sure. to leave something for future generations. And you see it now, I mean, you know, in serious issues such as climate, there's a, it's an interesting point you make that I think some people feel that because it doesn't appear to be a problem very imminently, although actually that's changed in the last few it's years. It is for becoming, sure, yeah. becoming quite obvious now. But if you go back 10 years, I think people felt, if you've got predictions saying in 100 years' time, there are going to be problems. And I think you're right. Some people just switch off at that point. And here we're talking about, well, tens of billions, hundreds of billions of years in the future. Uh, it certainly gives us a fabric, right, for why religion exists, because it bridges the unknown. I mean, is that how you see the creation myth? The, the, you know, this idea that there's a suggestion of a God um, because it's not eternal? One, the, a, a basic point is if you think what science is, it's the it's 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 people who take delight in the unknown because you can't do research without that so you have to research means that you're mm. standing on the edge of the known looking out into the unknown and enjoying that right so you're not making something up you accept that there are things mm. that you don't know and then you set out to try and discover as much as you can about the things that you don't know that's right. a different mindset, I think, to the to the the other side of the coin. The other extreme is that we are afraid of the unknown. So you either decide not to go there, you don't open the door, you just hide, or right. you just yeah. invent stuff. You just make stuff up, right? <laughs> you know, you just because you just don't <laughs> want to say right. I don't know but for whatever reason you, it bothers you. And I think that's a really important point. It, th there's a very famous essay, which I'd recommend to everyone, if you've not read it. It's called The Value of Science by Richard Feynman, who's a, a great hero for virtually all scientists, physicists anyway, yeah. all wanted to be Feynman at some point, right? Nobel Prize winning physicist, tremendous character. Great book called Surely You Must Be Joking, Mr. Feynman, actually, which is a collection of stories about him. Um, but he wrote an essay in 1955, I think it was. It's available on the web. Mm -hmm. MIT have made it publicly available called The Value of Science, Richard Feynman. You type in, you'll get it. And uh, in that essay, he came out of the Manhattan Project. So he'd been, he works on the atomic bomb with Oppenheimer and others. And he he, he sort of says in the, in the preamble, he's, he's, he was surprised he was even alive in the, in the 50s because there's a strong feeling from Feynman, Oppenheimer and others, the people who worked on the atom bomb that they delivered a power to the politicians in society that politicians in society could not control. And they were mm. pretty, they were almost right. You know, if you go forward a few years, there's Cuban Missile Crisis and so on. So they weren't far off. So what it caused many of them to do is reflect on the value of this mode of thought. That, and Because as I said, science, this embracing of the unknown. Mm -hmm. And he said, that, that, that probably the most important thing of all, and not the things, you know, like in today's language, the iPhones or the computers or the internet or the, the vaccines, right, that science delivers, even those things, not the most important, it's the mindset. And mm. the mindset is that accepting the fact that we don't know everything, 
right? Accept that. That's the basis, that's the foundation on which all reliable knowledge, I would argue, that we have today about nature and the universe is built. It's because someone said, I don't know. And if right. you extend that, if the more people we have in our society, particularly in positions of power, actually, who are prepared to say, I don't know, <laughs> we might try, or the, the data has changed, right? The, I know some more now, so I'll change my position. The more people that know that, the better. And just to finish, he said that even if you think about what democracy is, mm. right, that most valuable thing that seems to have nothing to do with science, it's the same idea. Because democracy, the most important thing about democracy is that you change government. <laughs> That's the most important thing. You mm. change every four or five years. Why? Because you accept that nobody knows how to run a society. <laughs> wow. That's why. If you thought you knew, you would be a dictator and you wouldn't change government. So it, it's a brilliant essay. That's a I strongly beautiful, beautiful thought. Yeah, that's interesting. It's like in order to accept that you don't know something, you need to have the humility. I, like, I don't know the answer. That takes a certain maturity. Yeah. And honesty, intellectual honesty. Yeah, yeah. I feel like what you're saying as we stand like on the edge of the known is that science might actually arrive at the idea that God d does exist. And that's what we've discovered now. Do you know what I'm saying? It's, science is the study of nature. Wow, um, yeah. And uh, uh, so nature is reality it's out there right and, and science mm -hmm. is not to you know to go around proving or disproving things or you know having some pre preordained idea of what nature is like it's just we're just trying to understand nature yeah. so yeah. if there are elements of nature that are completely incomprehensible to us at the moment but we stumble across them and we can observe them then they i, I would argue yeah. that they're then science well, because that, that, science is a study of nature just to go back on this 13.8 billion years is the concept of time hmm. right and and so this is clearly human made the word time but it's actually a very very important aging instrument that gets to talk about if i look in the sky how do i know it's 13.8 billion years how do i know there's a couple of trillion stars and how do i know that's just not light we are refracting a certain way it's a it's a Perfect question. Thank you. Uh, because it seems impossible, doesn't it? It seems, how can you yeah. know? Yeah. How can you measure the distance to a star, for example? Yeah, like, how can you? How do you know? Did you just It was decide? a tremendous effort. If you go back to the 17th century, 16th century, 18th century, it, the, the, the great, the LHC, you know, the Large Hadron Collider or the Apollo program of the time right. was to try to measure the distance initially from the Earth to the Sun, mm. which is called one astronomical unit. And uh, that was done in a, in a very subtle and clever way by watching something called the transit of Venus, which is a, when the Venus floats across the face of the Sun. And by watching it from different positions on the Earth, you, you can do some geometry and they were very smart and they figured out they could use this to find the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Amazing. Once you have that, you use parallax, believe it or not, to get mm -hmm. the distance to the nearest stars. Right. Because What's if you, parallax? It, so parallax is, you know, with your eyes, if you, if, you, if you close one eye and then close the other eye and something moves, right? No so way. You see that it moves. Yeah. So that's so, like, you so, know where you right. have true aim? It's the one where you don't move and then you close the other <laughs> eye. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so you do that. that, that, and it moves. that it's because of the distance between your eyes. Uh, and yeah. so, so you close one, you close the other, and the angles change a bit, and you can see how far something is away. And Amazing. that's how you perceive depth to some extent. Yeah. If you know the distance from the Earth to the Sun, then you can look at the position of a star in the sky in, let's say, January, and then look at it in July. And you've gone halfway around the Sun. So your mm. eyes, in that case, are twice the distance from the Earth to the Sun. Right, right. 180 million miles or something like that. That makes sense. And you see the star shift a bit. Yes. <laughs> right. Because it's just the same as doing that. Right. From no January way. To January. And that's how you do the distance to the nearest stars. Mm -hmm. And then from then, what happens is you try to find some relationship between the brightness of a star and something else that it does. Mm -hmm. And that there are things called variable stars, which, which vary. So they go light and dark and light and dark. And they vary in a way that's proportional to how bright they actually are, which is a really thing to call Cepheid variables. And so if you know how bright something is, 
actually, and you know how bright it looks, then you can guess how, or, or calculate how far away it is, right? Because the further away it is, the dimmer it is, <laughs> because you know how bright you know. So that's another way of doing it. Then we have things called Type One A supernova explosions, which are mm -hmm. very bright, and we know how bright they actually are, and we can see them in distant galaxies, and that allows us to tell how far away the galaxies are. Then finally, which goes to the end of your question, right. you find that if you look at very distant galaxies, then the light from them is stretched, it means it goes redder because longer wavelength light is redder. Uh -huh. It's called redshift. Uh -huh. And you find that the further away the galaxy is, the more stretched the light is. So right. it's a direct measurement you can make. And that tells you how fast the universe is expanding. Because what's happened is the light has been traveling across space for, you know, 50 million years or 100 million years, or mm. sorry, billion years, even, well, yeah, whatever. Let's say f you can see them out to 10 billion years or something like that. That's crazy. Right. And, and, and it means that the light has been traveling for 10 billion years across the universe. And if it's stretched by, like, say, a factor of three, then it tells you the universe is stretched by a factor of three during that time. So that allows you to measure the expansion rate of the universe. And if you know how fast it's expanding at all these different times, then you can wind it back using Einstein's theory, actually, right. to go, when was everything on top of each other? So it's it's a whole thing that began back in the 1600s with these uh, and 1700s with these missions around the world on sailing ships. Amazing. There's a great, to, to measure the transit of Venus, and then you get the distance, and then you get another distance, another distance. It's called the distance ladder. So it's a story that spans centuries, this idea that people just wanted to measure distances, the distance to the stars, and that's wow. how you do okay. it. Okay, can I ask a really stumpy question? You know, you've got the distance ladder and you're mapping the stars essentially, right? And you've quoted yeah. some incredible numbers. I mean, the size is so hard to comprehend. So, and then in the physics world, in the physicist world, does someone actually pick up where the other person left off to continue mm. mapping? Because it's obviously an immense amount of work, right? So to arrive at the numbers you're at now, like oh, yeah, billions now of stars. A, it's really exciting now, because now there's a satellite up there called Gaia, mm -hmm, which is right. a satellite that's um, mapping the positions and speeds of stars in the mm. Milky Way. And it's doing cool. thousands of them, thousands and thousands and thousands. So it's building a 3D map of the galaxy and it's measuring how the stars are moving. And if you know where the stars are and how they're moving, then you can run that movie forwards and backwards in time. So you can see the history of the, of the galaxy and the future of the galaxy. And by doing that, this data is allowing us to say that, you know, um, let's say five billion years ago there was a collision between two a smaller galaxy in the milky way mm -hmm. and you can see those stars still orbiting in a different way around the milky way today and trace that all back and so you can do galactic archaeology mm -hmm. and you oh, start to see That's crazy how the galaxy evolved and you start to see there are suggestions that there are connections between collisions between galaxies and the formation of our solar system because these collisions affect star formation rates and things. Mm. So you could start to think, well, is it possible that we exist and we're talking now because of a galactic collision that happened right. seven billion years ago? Yeah. And we're at the level of precision where we can start to talk in those terms and answer questions like that. When is it when is it going to be like finished? It's up there now. I don't know um, exactly when it is taking data or but but it's it's data set is being analyzed now i think it's probably still taking data actually Amazing. but yeah i can't quite <laughs> i don't i don't know the answer <laughs> to that question there you go <laughs> there you go it's, it's, <laughs> i think it's still i could go on my phone and uh, check uh, yeah. a quick question to the layman um you know we space and, and scientists uh have used this term you know number of light years away Perhaps you want to give a little definition of why we need to measure it in light years. Why don't they just say, look, we're five and a half years away from getting to Pluto or whatever, <laughs> right? Well, it's because light is its one of the strangest things in the universe, but one of the most useful because it sure. always travels at the same speed. Mm -hmm. It's what's called a constant of nature. Right. So oh. no matter how the thing moves that emits the light mm -hmm. or how the thing's moving that's going to receive the light, the light travels 
Uh, there's a great book. I'm, I'm wrapping a load of books now. There's a great book on relativity <laughs> by um, Robert Gerosh. It's, it's kind of a, an older book now, but he's one of the great experts. And he says in that book that light seems to care about space and time, right? the fabric of the universe. It doesn't okay. care about what emitted it or what received it. It just goes along. It's, so it's a perfect measuring instrument because right. it always travels at the same speed. It doesn't matter if the thing that emitted it is flying away from you at 99% the speed of light. If it emits light towards you, the light comes at the speed of light and goes past you. Wow. So that allows you to measure, not, well, it allows you to measure distances, which is why it's useful, because a light year sure. is the distance light travels in a year. And it, you, you, you know, if, if I said the distance a baseball travels in a year, you'd say, well, that's a stupid unit of measurement, because how fast <laughs> right. did you throw the baseball? But light <laughs> right. travels at the same speed. So that's why right. it's useful. It's much more than that, though. Light, because it travels at the same speed, always, and nothing travels faster than light. It defines what's called the causal structure of the universe. So it tells us if you have something that happens, can that something influence something else or not? Like for example, if something happens and um, so anything that's, let's say there's a year light travel time. Mm -hmm. So anything that's further away than a light year Right. for that time for a mm -hmm. year, w within the space of a year you can't communicate with it it can't influence it there can be no co um, communication between the two because you'd have to go faster than light to get from that place to the other event and so so light the light plays a fundamental role in relativity it's not only useful it actually defines what's called the causal structure of the universe and that's where you get into which we might talk about black holes and things because they're regions of space oh, we from will which be. even yeah. light can't escape no, oh, 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 there's a there's a forthcoming attraction, okay? Yeah. In the movie <laughs> Isn't business. That handy? That's, that, that's coming soon. By the way, just for the listeners, with all the books and all the other sources of information, we will be posting all of this on Great. our website. It's jacksonmartinshow. <laughs> oh, for sure. com. This one. You heard th this one is a this is a classic book. And um, it's it's one of the it's written in the seventies. It's the textbook, one of the great textbooks on black holes and cosmology, Stephen Hawking and George Awesome. Ellis. And there's a there's a and I, I put myself on the spot now, and it's a really ridiculous thing to do in a podcast because I was going to read something from the introduction. Are you going to give us a bit means, of poetry? That means that I need to... Uh, <laughs> it's a textbook. So the large-scale structure of space-time, like Hawking and Ellis. It is, it, is, it, it is brilliant, but it says here... Uh, where is it? Uh, I, what, no, no, this is, this is not a good thing to do, is it? <laughs> Because I can't find the quote, but it, but it's somewhere in the, it's somewhere in the introduction where he says that because see the thing is that so so light travels through space and time at this constant speed and right. divides it up into regions that can influence particular events and regions mm -hmm. where events can't influence other events. So they say in there something that gravity and gravity tells you how all that curves and bends and sure. warps. Right, that's why. And so, so in that sense, it determines the causal structure of the universe. That's what they say in the introduction. It's gravity that, that, tell, that tells you and warps space and tells you which regions can influence other regions and which can't. It's beautiful. We'll come back to gravity for the moment. But if we want to get past that wonderful ice-breaking session and back to a quick definition of you know, what is particle physics uh, as it will pertain to the rest of the, the discussion. <laughs> So particle physics is um, the study of the smallest building blocks of the universe and the forces mm -hmm. that operate between them. And in particular, uh, the, the forces excluding gravity. So we, we, gravity doesn't come into particle physics at the moment. Perfect. And the, it, it should do, right. we think, which is where black holes come in again, which we'll talk about in a bit. But um, at the moment, the reason is gravity is so weak as a force between particles that it's completely unmeasurable mm -hmm. but there are three other forces in the universe there's uh, the familiar one is electromagnetism which is right. you know, electricity magnetism fridge magnets and so on that's one force and then there are two forces that operate in the atomic nucleus called the weak and strong nuclear forces and then mm -hmm. um, they're the things that stick the nucleus together and mm -hmm. allow radioactive decay and so on and uh, so it's the study of those forces and the, the, the fundamental particles that interact through those forces that I would define as particle physics. Okay, that's a 
that's a fabulous definition. Can you just describe those latter two forces? Because I think most people, electromagnetism, some people will get, and, and you gave a, a quick you know, description of how we might see that in everyday life. But perhaps mm. you can just elaborate a little further on the other two forces that we can describe. Well, yeah. I mean, you think about what I mean by a force, by the way, it's the means by which things interact with each other in the universe. So you, we're sitting on a chair now or standing on a, the floor or something. Uh, th there are forces acting. Um, mm. Why don't you fall through the chair? Right. There's something stopping you falling through the chair. And that's electromagnetism, actually. Um, and uh, So is and, it because and... of electromagnetism I'm not well, falling through my chair? The... It's the, the, there's actually there are two bits to it. One bit is that there are there are electrons, right. which are negatively charged things in the atoms in your chair and in your ass. If you want to, whatever <laughs> the best way of saying that. I was wondering and, when you were going to tell me that I've got a magnet in my ass. Uh, whatever, <laughs> and uh, and like charges repel. So there's there's a there's a force. But, uh, the, wow. And there's also actually there's also it should be said um, a, a quantum mechanical effect, which is electrons don't like to be close to each other. Which is called mm -hmm. the exclusion principle. So you try and squash them closely; they they, they repel each other, and they right. also try and avoid each other. And the combination of those is is what makes stuff rigid, solid, right? So what right. what what why is why is a brick wall solid? It's ultimately those effects. So it's forces. That's all there is. That's how you perceive the universe. It's why you stick together, mm -hmm. right? So there's electromagnetism, which is a long range force, which is responsible for everything actually mm -hmm. that we experience other than gravity. But if you go into the atom, deep into the atom, there's an atomic nucleus and the electrons go around the nucleus. Yes. And that nucleus is made of little things, um, protons and neutrons, but they're in turn made of things called quarks, which are the smallest things that we know I've of. never heard of a quark. I've got well, as far they, as the nucleus, yeah. Well, they make, so they make, so you have two up quarks and a down quark, roughly in a proton, and two downs what? and an up in a neutron, right? So they, right. they make up the protons and neutrons. Those things are stuck together mm -hmm. by something called the strong nuclear force, which is way stronger than electromagnetism yeah. at very short. But 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 it but it doesn't leak out of the nucleus. Mm -hmm. It kind of fades away, um, and so 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 you don't see it. You don't yeah. feel it. No. We, we don't really interact with it, other than it's holding our atomic nuclei together. So it's right. really important. Yes. And then the, the other one, the weak force, is something that allows protons to turn into neutrons. Wow. Uh, and that's really important because what happens in the sun? So in yeah. the sun, the sun shines by taking hydrogen, which is protons, mm -hmm. single protons, mm -hmm. right. and building helium, which mm -hmm. is the next simplest element. Helium nucleus is two protons and two neutrons. Right. So what has to happen is a proton has to turn into a neutron before it can stick together to make helium nuclei in the sun. And that's the weak nuclear force. So without that, the sun wouldn't shine, the stars wouldn't shine. But it seems like an appropriate time to talk about the particle that might be missing, uh, you know, the Large Hadron Collider experiment at CERN. I understand hmm. you've been or are involved in, in, in that as one of the researchers, uh, or you've yeah, participated. For years. Yeah, and I know you've visited it and, and, and all the rest of it. But if I frame it as you know there's this particle that, that has been described or has been named the higgs boson particle or also mm -hmm. aka the god particle uh, perhaps you'd like to describe for people what that is why it's significant and what the hell is this big thing in cern trying to do um at the speed of light to collide these particles yeah i mean we've discovered it now so it, it exists the higgs mm -hmm. particle it was uh, predicted by peter higgs and uh, others actually in the 1960s what? and it was discovered in the 21st century so it's when uh, you say predicted what was it that they predicted so the the problem was when when so so what what was a, th a physical theory right is some sort of framework usually a mathematical framework mm -hmm. that allows you to predict things mm -hmm. and um we had this framework called the standard model of particle physics, which was developed really from the 50s and 60s onwards mm -hmm. and really became sort of a full physical theory, I'd say, in the 70s and 80s. And um, that theory had a problem with it, and it had a problem with mass. Mm -hmm. so, right. so fundamentally, mass. If you give um, uh, an electron, for example, that they have mass, right? It was measured back in the, when was it, 18... Uh, the turn of the 20th century, mm -hmm. the mass of the electron was measured. Um, so it's, if you just give particles mass in the theory, just mathematically, just write it in, 
then there were huge mathematical problems. You basically couldn't do it. And so they had to find, the physicists had to find a way of giving particles mass without breaking the theory, without mm -hmm. m messing up the structure of the theory. And the way they found was this, the Higgs mechanism, which is um, essentially what you do is you introduce something else into the universe and things get mass by interacting with it. So, so there's an analogy that's often used. It's like wading through treacle or maple syrup or something yeah. like that. You know, you, you, mm. if you walk through stuff and it interacts with you and it slows you down and you get kind mm -hmm. of more massive. And it's kind of right. it's, it's kind of in that analogy that the correct thing to say is that particles get mass fundamentally. The fundamental particles like electrons mm -hmm. are getting mass by interacting with the Higgs field which permeates the universe. And that was a way of allowing the particles to have mass in the theory without messing the whole beautiful structure of the theory up. Mm -hmm. And it predicted that there was this thing called the Higgs boson, a particle associated with this field that fills the universe, which should be we should be able to make if we bang particles together with high enough energy. Mm -hmm. So if we build a big enough particle accelerator, we should be able to make Higgs particles and observe them. Wow. And so that's basically what the LHC was. It was it was guaranteed because we knew what the theory predicted that we would either find the Higgs boson at the LHC or some kind of Higgs boson or something else because the right. whole theory collapsed at those energies that the, the LHC bangs things together. The whole theory collapsed without the Higgs. So it was almost inevitable. It wasn't inevitable we'd find the Higgs because that was just a prediction. Yeah, nature can right. be cleverer, smarter than we are, right? It's often <laughs> right. Is. right. So it could have been something else. And in fact, my most cited paper. So in so in uh, in physics and science, you measure success of a paper by how many people refer to it in their own papers. Okay. And my most cited paper, which is like loads, hundreds and hundreds, it might be the thousand citations. It was was physics at the LHC without a light Higgs boson. <laughs> so I wrote uh, it before we discovered it, right? Right. With a couple right. of colleagues. And it, it, it gets cited for some other stuff that was developed in it. But it just shows you that in, in 2000, which I think I wrote the paper in 2000, uh, it was perfectly legitimate to think mm -hmm. that the Higgs particle would not be found, but something else, some more exotic mechanism would be found at the LHC. But then we found the Higgs, right. which is quite incredible, right? Because it was 50 years after mm -hmm. it was predicted mm. mathematically and that, there's a deep point right, that you can use mathematics to, to predict, make a prediction about reality. In this case, the existence of a particle. It's a yeah, real yeah. thing. And yeah. then 50 years later, you build the world's biggest you know, experiment, 27 kilometers in circumference underneath the ground, underneath Switzerland and France. Yeah. And, and all the 88 countries, I think, of the world came together sure. to do it. And you switch it on and you see the thing that this guy derived with a pencil in 1963 or whatever it was. <laughs> right? That's a remarkable thing, isn't it? it? It's insanity. That's incredible because it reminds me about what you said earlier about thinking more in the future tense. And you can think in that way with science and maths, basically. Yeah, again, it just makes me want to take it more seriously. Anyway, that's how it makes me feel. It's, it's remarkable. It's one of the great mysteries. There's a physicist called Eugene Wigner, a very famous physicist. Um, and he said that um, it's one of the great, it's one of the great mysteries that mathematics, he called it the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics mm -hmm. in the physical sciences. He wrote an essay, it's another essay that Wigner wrote this time. Um, but it's true in some sense. It's, it is one of the great mysteries mm. that for some reason, mathematics can be a guide to reality mm -hmm. remember said yeah. start, science is the observation of reality yes and the fact that you can you can predict things about reality using mathematics is interesting it's a whole discussion about why that might be the case it, okay. i think of math as as it's just another language to explain life right and that's why it's so powerful it has its own construct its own principles but it is at the end of the day a language a way to express 
And uh, you're right, it's, it's incredibly powerful when you think we've got to go and build plant machinery. We need technology. We need to evolve, <laughs> you know, to get what the power of a pen and a mind had <laughs> all, the, all those years ago. I have a, two very quick things on this, if I, if I might. One is that um, I just want to, f for the audience, state that in this 27 kilometers underground that you were accelerating these particles, they were traveling at the speed of light, right? No, no just, just below. Massless particles have to travel at the speed of light. And anything wow. with mass has to travel slower than the speed of light. Makes yeah, total sense. Them. Makes total sense. That is sense. crazy. Now, the God particle, it's been discovered. So what's the significance? What like what do we do yeah, now? Just to say by, by the way, the God particle, that was um Leon Lederman, um, one of the great Nobel Prize winning physicists, invented that term. He, he wrote a book which got called The God Particle. It was about the Higgs and the quest for it. Right. And uh, but he subsequently said that he really hated that. I think he blamed it on his publisher and said it was total bollocks. You know, it's not it's not it's not <laughs> nothing to do with God. No, it's, but, it, but it sold books, right? right, so, right. You know, so it got me. It's great. I ain't going to lie. It's it got me. To, but, <laughs> but, um, but so what, what? So as I said, the Higgs is, is now one of the, as far as we can tell, the fundamental components of reality. Right? It's, it's a, it's a, it, it was a new kind of fundamental particle that we'd suspected. Now we know it exists. So it opens a door to mm -hmm. a deeper understanding. What, what we're doing at LHC now, one of the th many things we're doing, other than searching for other particles, is to try and make as many Higgs particles as we can so we can mm -hmm. watch them and see how they behave and observe them. Because we want to know. There are a lot of big questions about this thing and yeah. um, how it came to be here, how it fits in with a wider framework. You know, so, so we're just at the beginning. It's, um, it's almost like discovering a planet and saying, oh, good, we've discovered it now. We're, we're actually, you want to go to the planet yeah, <laughs> what happens? yeah. there's yeah. a lot to know and so so it, it's 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 no i'd say it's not quite right to say, it's a very important part of of our understanding of fundamental physics um it's not the god particle right it's not the answer it's not the end of it's the beginning it's just it's another of those fundamental components which is extremely important yeah sure and and, and when you when we think of just to describe to the layman when we say it gives us mass would it, is it fair to say that we exist because of this particle? Uh, it is, in a sense, because if you took it away, then we, the, we would be nothing. The, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> but then again, it's the same with the electron, mm, or right. the quarks, or the or gravity, or any. So there's a long <laughs> list of things. <laughs> take them all if away. If you take any of them away, <laughs> then then we wouldn't be here. But yeah, so so but it, it is fundamental. I think it's it's profoundly important that. That without it, you you would not have complex structures in the universe. That's clearly true. right. That may, I'm wondering how deep that might be for the listeners. It's the deepest question. I mean, I have a friend I work with a lot, Jeff Forshaw at Manchester, who I write papers and books with, and he always says that the 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 most incredible thing is that we anything exists at all. Right? Yeah. It's, yeah. it's just that the, 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 the it's the great unanswered question. Mm. Is which we started with really is why why does the universe exist at all? Yeah, and 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 um, it's so complex. It, I mean, even we when know. we're talking about the speed of light, <laughs> I'm just listening to that and I'm just like, wow, what a handy tool! Thank you to the speed of light for being so constant. It's, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's remarkable. I mean, it's part of the the it, it feeds into Einstein's theory of relativity, which is it's part of the structure of the universe itself. I mean, obviously, our our assumptions. And the discoveries that scientists made are there to be challenged, right? And they're there to evolve. And you know, one 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 thesis may turn into a completely different outcome revisited ten years later. Could our assumptions be wrong about the Higgs boson particle or about the way we define an electron? Right? Well, how much wrong confidence do we have with this kind of taxonomy that we're using? It it's, it's a good question. and It's almost certainly the case that the electron is not a fundamental building block of nature. Right. And, and likewise, I suppose, the, the, the Higgs in that sense, it, we, we strongly suspect there's a deeper layer. Mm -hmm. So you right. hear about things called string theory and, and absolutely, like that, which, yeah. So, so um, what, what experimentally, which is all there really is in science, right? I suppose when you, what, what, what we're saying is, 
that with the biggest microscope in the world, these yeah. things look like point-like objects. So we cannot measure any size when it comes to an electron. We can when it comes to a proton, which we did in the 60s ultimately. So we we, we thought maybe that's a little point-like thing and it wasn't. We, it turned out it's quite a big thing with internal structure because we got a bigger microscope. And so it's... it's when you say bigger, can you give me a point of well, reference a better, in the real world? A, like A better microscope, one that can see smaller things. When you're comparing the size of a proton to an electron, oh yeah, oh, it's well, bigger, are we talking well, like a goldfish to a tadpole? What are we saying? Oh, well, in a sense, I mean, in a sense, it's a, so, so, so a, a proton is because we don't know how big an electron oh, is. Okay. <laughs> right, I can't quite answer your question. It, it, as far as we can tell, it's got no size what? at all. Um, but it, but it, that's probably not right. That's almost yeah. certainly yeah. not right. Yeah. It, you know, we, we have a, an idea called the, the Planck length, which we'll get to again if we do black holes, which is something we can infer is the smallest distance we can talk of with any understanding. And that's way, 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 way smaller than the proton. Um, but um, but we can't measure those distances. So that, that it's, it's experimental in a way at the moment, particle physics. We have a theory that tells us how the smallest things we can see, that as far as we can tell, have got no size, <laughs> but probably do, but how they interact with each other and right. how they build up the world that we see. But I'm sure there's an underlying... Um, structure yeah. that we've not yeah. discovered yet so let's just define what what people think space is so it's, you know you've got, you've got people like felix Baumgartner, you know going up three hundred thousand. was it anyway so he's up there and and you know at what point is he actually in space versus you know he's somewhere in the stratosphere or, or within earth's gravity ah so space so space in that sense Right, it has got an arbitrary definition. I think it's is it hundred kilometers. That's or what I heard. Up. Yeah, there's there's a and, and people say if you go above that, you're an astronaut. You're in right. space. Um, you, you've not you've not really. There's no clear definition okay. of what you mean mm -hmm. by that because you you could say because you never escape. The, it, you think about it really technically, being really pedantic. That the gravitational pull of the Earth falls away as the square of the distance right. away. So you double your distance away, and it goes down by a factor of four. So in that sense, you never escape <laughs> the the pull of the Earth completely. I mean, you you get into the gravitational influence of other objects, so it becomes negligible. Um, but so so you know, and likewise with the atmosphere, you know, it just dissolves away tenuously until there's not much of it left as you go up. But it's an arbitrary definition. But that's not what we're talking. Well, it, it, well, it's so at that point with Felix, you know, where he supposedly like skydive from space. If we're going up. Do you just get to a point where you start floating, basically? No, I mean, you, you're not, you know, the, like, the, the, the Earth's gravitational pull is pretty much as strong as it is on ah. the ground. Um, the floating thing is extremely important, right? If we want <laughs> Let, to talk let's about do it. Let's physics do it. and gravity. So, so what, what is happening in, in the space station, right? In the International Space Station where the astronauts are floating, um, right? So that means that by floating, you mean if there's a pen or something. Here's a, here's a pen. It's an apple pen, there you go. and you let go of it, and you let go of it, it yeah. doesn't move. That's what you mean, isn't it? So you, you, you sat there and you go, it stays where it's... Um, so Newton would have said that what's happening is that the, the this... I mean, this is the way you think of an orbit, that the space station is falling towards the Earth, but it's moving sufficiently fast in that direction that it keeps mm -hmm. missing. Yep. So it's constantly falling. Um. The question is, though, it's kind of interesting if you think about it. So the gravitational pull on the space station, in Newton's language, is bigger than the gravitational pull on the astronauts because the space station is more mm -hmm. massive. And Newton says that the more massive you are, the stronger the pull of gravity. But Newton also says that, but it's also, if you think about gravity pushing, like a force pushing something, it's harder to accelerate something if it's more massive. So it's hard, you have to push a bus harder than a bike to accelerate yeah, yeah. it, right, to 10 miles an hour or whatever. And those things cancel out in Newton's mm -hmm. picture. So the gravitational pull is pulling everything down and it's pulling on the more massive things more than the less massive things. But it's also harder to accelerate the more massive things and the less massive things. And it all cancels out and everything just stays there. Right. <laughs> right. Einstein realized that there's a better explanation for that. And it's better in the sense it's a better mm -hmm. theory. Uh, Einstein 
says that the reason that everything just floats is because there are no forces acting on them at all. Very right. simple. Now, this is really Whoa. weird. It's, it's, uh, what, what's happening is in Einstein's picture is in free yeah. fall. So you're falling towards the earth right? In from one picture. Free fall is what you call it. You call it, it's got a fancy name, which is an inertial frame of reference. It means no forces mm -hmm. are acting. So in free fall, if I let go of something, why does it stay there? Because there are no forces acting. Oh, okay, yeah. So nothing goes anywhere. So free fall is the natural state of things. So Einstein says it's actually on the surface of the earth, standing on the surface of the earth is where something's happening to you. Um, you you're not in free fall anymore. Something's got in the mm -hmm, way mm -hmm. of your free fall through space and time, actually through space time. Something's in the way. It's the surface right. of the earth. And the earth exerting a force on you, right? Stopping you falling in your nice sure. natural, the way of things. And that force is accelerating you because it does, because <laughs> forces accelerate. So what's happening in Einstein's picture is that you're sat on your chair now. And the reason you think you've got weight is because you're flying upwards. You're being accelerated upwards at 9.8 meters per second squared, and you're being pressed into your chair, just in the same way that if you accelerate in a car, you get pressed into the seat. It's exactly the same thing in Einstein's picture. Wow. What Einstein says is that there's a fabric of the universe, which is called space-time, mm -hmm. but we always call it the fabric of the universe, and it's distorted by the presence of matter and energy, so it curves. And, and everything on its natural way of things will fall, will, will just take nice straight lines through that curved mm -hmm. space. That's the natural way of things. If you're taking a natural straight line, which the astronauts and the space station are, then everything's fine and there are no forces, there's nothing, and everything just floats and it's all very nice. Uh, if you disrupt that straight line because something gets in the way, uh, then you feel a force. That's fascinating. And so it's a completely, it's a, that's, that's the fundamental basis of Einstein's theory of gravity. Right completely different Absolutely. to Newton. I always say, you know, Newton said, you know, the apple, I mean, it's apocryphal, but the apple fell on his head from the uh, tree. Wow. And, uh, but Einstein said, no, Newton accelerated up to headbutt the apple. <laughs> that's basically, <laughs> that's, it's a completely different <laughs> way of looking. I mean, we've got so many more questions, but let's deal with the black hole. We've been dancing around it. But we don't, We've been flirting with the idea. So why why does the theory not work? And start with a if you could for everyone a, a, a kind of general definition of a black hole. So a black hole. I mean the the way that they're made in nature, which is a good place to start. The the one the ones that we observe in the sky are by the collapse of uh, some of the smaller ones. The collapse of mm -hmm. stars, very massive stars. So you've got a very very massive star. Let's say. 30, 40 times the mass of the sun. Let's go really big. Which, and there are plenty of those around in the universe. And they, they hold themselves up against the pull of their mm -hmm. own gravity by burning nuclear fuel, which releases energy, which creates a pressure, which holds them up. So they're kind of a, they're in equilibrium, right? They're trying to collapse and they're, they're hot and everything's moving around. They hold up. But ultimately, they'll run out of nuclear right. fuel because of a finite mm -hmm. size. And so they stop doing that and mm -hmm. they collapse. And for these very massive things, tens of times the mass of the sun, nothing can stop them collapsing. And so they get denser and denser and denser. They collapse, they collapse, they collapse. Now for every object, if you think about the pull of gravity on the surface of the, of the, of the surface of the earth, then you, we know you, know you can build a rocket, you can escape, right. you have to go at some speed, whatever it is, 17,000 sure. miles an hour. I can't remember mm -hmm. exactly what it is, but you've got to go to get out. Um, if you crush the earth down and make it denser then you get closer and closer to all this mass and so the gravitational pull at the surface gets bigger right and so if you keep crushing it you can imagine you get to a point where you'd have to travel at the speed of light to get off mm. and for, it's called the Schwarzschild radius of the the earth and that's for the earth it's about if I remember rightly, about 1.4 millimetres or something like uh, that. Wow. I know what it is for the sun. For the sun, it's three mm -hmm. kilometres. So if you squash the sun down into a ball that was three kilometres, then you'd have to, you, you, even light couldn't escape from the surface. And that's that collapse is what makes a black hole. So it's when it's when something collapses and collapses and collapses, nothing can stop it. And it goes inside its Schwarzschild radius 
So there's a region of space where you'd have to go faster than light. So there's space inside that little dot. That three point Saturn dot. In Einstein's theory, absolutely yes. Right. So, uh, so, so the space and essentially the thing collapses out of existence, and so you've just got this kind of this this kind of really heavily distorted space inside, and this singularity that we don't know about somewhere, which is in a very real sense the end of time actually in there. And so you get this complete distortion of space and time. So that's a black hole. So so it's defined by this this region, which we call the event horizon. Mm, yeah, which has yeah. Got this, you know, everybody knows the word, which is basically the region of space where if you go in, you, you're fine, according to general relativity. You, you'd be in there, but you can't get out. And more than that, you not only can you not get out, but you're t- you are going to the end of time. Mm-hmm. No way. And actually, for, for black holes that are quite big, even like the one at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, these things that are millions of times the mass of the sun, the end of time is is minutes away from you, even in the biggest ones. So you can go in, but you, you the time is going to end for you. you. You go into the singularity, if you like, but it's better to say you go to the end of time. So that's a Can you <laughs> see everything that's ever happened in that part of space, like ever? Like if you go in, you could watch it all happen. And obviously you can't yeah, you come can't, back out you again. You can't actually. Yeah, it's actually a misnomer that. It's, it, people often say it, but it's not right, in fact. But I, I know, what you, I mean, people have said it, for, loads of people say it, but it's wrong, actually, when you look at actually, the, the, because you're in there, one way to think about it, because you're in there for quite a short time before mm-hmm. your time ends, you, you, you don't receive anything <laughs> There's like- There's no epiphany. The, the whole future of the universe. <laughs> no, no. So, um, so, so the- so that's kind of interesting, you know, it's cool, right? It's a really fascinating idea, these completely collapsed mm-hmm. stars, the supermassive black holes, billions of times the mass of the sun at the center of galaxies, uh, all fascinating. But in the, the reason they're really mm-hmm. interesting is because in the, in the 1970s, Stephen Hawking um, noticed that they're not, it, it's, people say black holes aren't completely black, right? So you might think black hole, nothing escapes Mm -hmm. so that's it if you go in you're gone and it just stays there forever because nothing gets out he found that they do actually radiate they have a temperature they behave like anything else and radiation comes off them it's called hawking radiation and that ultimately makes them evaporate away in the very far future billions of billions of times the current age of the universe right these things last forever almost but not quite it looks like they evaporate and that caused absolute havoc in physics and the reason it caused havoc is because people were worried about what happens when you throw something in what happens to the mm-hmm. information so if i get this book stephen's textbook and throw it into the black hole um does that information get destroyed or does it come back into the universe in the hawking radiation mm-hmm. eventually now it's a fundamental part of all of science i would say physics certainly information isn't destroyed right right? if you know if you know and this is kind of an act of belief almost it's foundational if you know everything about the universe at some point Mm -hmm. some time you know everything's moving around and everything that's in there then you can predict what's going to happen Mm -hmm. in the future and you could predict what had happened in the past information is not destroyed but it looked to many people like black holes destroy information. Because the question was, when this thing's evaporated away, where's, what's happened to all the stuff sure. that went in? Right? Has it all... And then you said time ends. Yeah, in, in, in general relativity, it's the end of time in the middle. So, so there's something funny going on, basically, in black holes. And this argument went on for yeah. 50 years. It is probably still going on, but it's almost, it's pretty much been solved now, most people think. The answer basically is the information comes out in the Hawking radiation. But in order mm-hmm. to do that, we've had to completely destroy, I would say, our notion of what space and time is. Wow. Right. So then this is when you start, people say, you've probably heard it when people say the universe is a hologram. Yeah. You might have heard that stuff, right? Yeah. It, yeah. It's because. It's because the way that the information appears to get out of the black hole in the Hawking radiation seems to be like see seems to require a non-locality in the universe. So it seems to say that in some sense the interior of the black hole 
might be also the far distant Hawking radiation that's gone out into the universe, hundreds of billions of light years away, probably by the time the black hole evaporates. But in some sense, it seems to be the same place. Uh, the, the other weird thing, which is easier to say, perhaps, is that mm -hmm. you go, well, if, if information goes into the black hole and then comes out again, eventually, it's stored somewhere, right? It, it must, it must, it has stay. to, right? it's like a hard yeah. disk, right? So, yeah, black holes are the ultimate hard drives, right? They can store more information than anything else yeah. in the universe. Mm -hmm. But if you say, how much, how much information can I fit in a black hole? Right, you say, well, well, what what is it going to be proportional to? Well, you think, if how much information can I fit in a library? It must be something to do with the volume of the library. Well, how there must be a capacity. Right. right, it must be the capacity yeah, of the library. Sure. How much can I fit in? With a black hole, the amount the the amount of information you can that's stored there is proportional to its surface right. area, and not its volume. Right. Oh. So so it's the it's yeah. the surface area of the event horizon. And so it seems that in some sense, the maximum amount of information you can fit in any in any area of space right. is nothing to do with the volume. Okay. It's to do with the surface area only. And that's the holographic thing. That's mm. saying, well, that's like a hologram. It's saying that these things seem to be telling us that the, the universe is, is really, in a sense, got less dimensions. It's mm -hmm. somehow that everything's happening yeah. on a surface. And what we we perceive in, in, in the interior, the interior doesn't really yeah. exist yeah. in the sense that a hologram doesn't yeah, exist. Right, right. Really, yeah. It's all, it's all <laughs> a flat thing. If, all the information's if, on some surface. And that seems to be what they're telling flat, us. If, it, if it's flat, <laughs> which is, I, I no longer want to travel through a black hole if I can just get all the information on the surface. Right? I mean, I mean if, if volume's not important. Well, yeah. And then, then you start saying what happens then. Because as I said before, going all the way, it's probably too much. But when, when I was talking about Einstein earlier, I was talking about free fall and the fact that when you're falling freely, then nothing's happening to you, mm -hmm. right? Now, in Einstein's description of a black hole, this thing, the event horizon, is nothing. It's not mm -hmm. there in the theory mm -hmm. of relativity. You just fall through it. You don't notice. For a very big black hole in particular, you don't notice anything. It's, it's, it's part of the fundamental structure of the theory because you're just floating. Right, you you might as well be standing still. I mean, just in a deep sense, you just float. Through. Yeah. But then we've also got this quantum mechanics and the stuff that Stephen had originally calculated, which is saying somehow that information is stored on the boundary of the black hole on the event horizon, but the event horizon is not there. Right. right. Mm. You know, Einstein said. So what what is it? What, what what are we saying? And this is led to probably the deepest insights into fundamental physics of the last few decades, trying to just reconcile those two things. And it's all very simple questions about what happens if you throw something into a black hole. Right. Does it come out again? How does it get out? How is the information encoded? And the last thing I'll say, which is the best thing of all, and I have no understanding of what this means, is that so this year and last year, some of the mm -hmm. some of the, you might say, well, if the information comes out, in the Hawking radiation, how is it encoded? Mm -hmm. like, how am I how am I going to measure it? How can I reconstruct what went in? And it turns out that the people who seem to have worked that out are quantum computer engineers, and not physicists, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems that the information is encoded in a in a in a way that we use when we're building quantum computers to make error correction work in the memory of quantum computers. Oh. So there's some deep link between quantum <laughs> computing blowing. That's incredible. And black holes yeah. and gravity, yeah. space and time, quantum mechanics, all mixed up in these bizarre objects. And that's why they're so fascinating. When, when you were describing the black hole and the way, the way it contracts, uh, I, I, it, for some reason, I, I kept thinking of solid, solid state drives, right? Okay, the chip that is, <laughs> yeah. is contracted yeah. to something so dense. A solid state drive is a good example. If you could say, well, what would, what would happen if I kept putting information in? If I kept trying to store more and more information sure. in my solid state drive, how much mm. can I get in? And ultimately, if you keep doing it mm. and keep putting stuff in and making smaller and smaller things, ultimately what happens is it collapses yeah. into a black hole. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and it collapses into a black hole in such a way that the maximum amount of information is just the area of its event horizon. 
you said earlier about a black hole being something like four times the sun and it will collapse at some point and it's like the equilibrium between the two so i assume like at some point the sun will collapse yeah but it's not it's not massive enough so there's a, there's something that will stop that mm -hmm. um, and and so gravity you know it's pulling it squashing it down there's a thing called uh, which is we we actually spoke about earlier which is mm -hmm. um the fact that electrons don't like to be close to each other yeah mm -hmm. remember yeah. i said that as a plays Absolutely. a role in yeah they were solid yeah so what happens when the sun collapses is that those electrons get pushed closer and closer together in the collapse mm -hmm. and they move around faster and faster trying to avoid each other mm -hmm. and that makes a pressure which can hold mm -hmm. it up it's called electron degeneracy pressure but that means that so for anything um less than 1.4 times the mass of the sun mm -hmm. it's called the chandrasekha limit then the chandrasekha the, limit the, the, then the that's after the physicist chandrasekha who worked it out then that pressure can hold it up so it becomes what's called a white dwarf star so a white Ooh. dwarf star is is held up by that there's another one so if you get a bit mm. more mass and it goes again because it can't the electrons basically what happens is electrons would have to move faster than light to mm -hmm. hold it and they can't so it collapses mm. again the uh, the protons turn into neutrons and you get a mm. neutron star and that's held up by the same thing but for neutrons and they're they're like you know stars the size of cities those things are more massive than the sun and 10 kilometers across or something like that held up by mm. the neutrons but if you do more and more and more if the neutrons can't hold it up and that's when mm. you go through the Schwarzschild gotcha. radius get so small that you go through the event horizon you, you, the event horizon comes mm -hmm. out essentially but that's not happening to our sun so so they they burn hydrogen into helium which is mm -hmm. what the sun is doing now it's called a main sequence star when they run when they run out of hydrogen then their core is basically helium so the mm -hmm. thing starts to collapse and then it heats up to the level where the helium can start yep. to stick yep. together to form carbon yep. and oxygen mm -hmm. that's where the carbon and oxygen in the universe come from and that so that regenerates the star for a while and it gets bright and hot and then and then and then it will run out of that and then the big ones can collapse again and they can build things all the way up to iron in fact in their cores and in the process they swell up to become red giant stars so so they become enormous in that phase of their life that the the sun will probably engulf the earth in that phase it might not quite that sometimes because it loses some mass the earth drifts out a bit but mm -hmm. roughly speaking it'll come out it'll certainly engulf mercury and venus and come out to what it'll approach the orbit of the earth in size uh, in that final phase of its life before ultimately it'll collapse um, and the sun's not that massive so when do you envisage over. that happening uh, it, we know it's it's about i mean it starts to change in, in a few billion years it ultimately it's got about five five billion years left or so and then and then the, ultimately what Fume. happens is the, no the, the, the 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 outer layers drift away and it becomes a white dwarf and something called wow. a planetary nebula if we have just a couple more definitions just because i think these words are, are in popular culture perhaps you'd like to uh frame for us what a supernova is not a champagne supernova just a supernova so a supernova there, there are some different types but basically it's just when the star reaches the end of its life runs out of fuel right. and collapses mm. um and so the, this collapse the what you'll get even when you form a black hole it doesn't just collapse and go it, you get these kind of bounces and it's chaotic and you, you emit loads of energy right. so it's a it's a basically an explosion that mm -hmm. releases a tremendous amount of energy. Now that's there, there are different types. The the other one, the one we use actually, you know, I said that some of some supernova, we know how bright they right. actually are. They're called type mm -hmm. 1A supernova. Right. And they're different. They're, they're, um, they're usually something like a a white a neutron star or a white dwarf. Um actually it'll be a let me just get this right. It'll be a white dwarf actually. Uh, with a with a companion star next to it and so remember the white dwarf has a limit mm -hmm. the chandrasekha limit can't be more than 1.4 times the mass of the sun so let's say it was 1.39 and it was there and there's a big star going around it and and yeah. there's stuff falling onto it from the big star so it goes over the limit right. and then it collapses yeah. 
and explodes in a supernova. And because we know the limit, we know the process is always the same. When we see one of these things, we can say, well, we know how bright you are, actually. And we know how bright you look. So that allows us to measure the distance yep. to you. Yep. And they're so bright that we can see them in galaxies that are way, way, you know, hundreds of millions of yep. light years away. And so we, that's how we measure the distance to galaxies. Brian, when was the last time we saw a supernova? I mean, we see them reasonably regularly. Um, so it would have been last year. We, we, we're always looking for them because every time we see one, yeah. we'll, we'll have seen them. We may well have seen one this year, actually. We see Because there's so many galaxies out there. So the, the rate of them mm. is something. There's a rule of thumb, which is one per galaxy per century, you tend mm. to say. Um, but of course, we can see hundreds of millions of right, galaxies. Yeah, right. <laughs> so... So, so we see a lot of them. And every time we see one, one of these special ones, the type 1a, we can use that data to refine our measurement of the age of the universe mm -hmm. because we can refine our measurement of the expansion of the universe. And so, so we're looking for them all the time and we see them all the time. What other definitions might be interesting in popular culture to understand space as we know it? And I'll give you and I'll throw one out there as, as one you could possibly answer for us. Is an exoplanet. Yeah, so exoplanets, if you go back to the 19, early 1990s, or certainly 1980s, better synthesizers, <laughs> better, key, better keyboards, we'll talk about that. Because was, uh, um, not better, but more characterful. Right. But anyway, um, then we didn't know of any planets beyond our solar system because we hadn't detected them. So even if we thought, well, we can't be special, we didn't know. Um, and then in the early 1990s, we started being able to detect planets. Um, and now we've detected well over 3,000. I can't remember the exact number. We've got missions up there like the Kepler telescope that are just trying to detect planets. So thousands of them. So now the statement is that pretty much every star in the sky will have planets around it, which is remarkable. If you go out, you know, it's a clear night. It's quite clear now, actually. If it's clear tonight, you go out and look at stars. You, you yeah. can imagine that there will be solar systems around every one, yeah. Yeah. pretty much. Ooh. Yeah. And so, so that allows us to start thinking, do do statistics and say, well, how many potentially Earth-like planets might yeah. there be in the Milky Way galaxy? And the answer is about twenty billion. That, okay, all right, we're onto something. We're on, we're on, we're onto some of the more controversial stuff. So there's uh, there's there's an Earth-like. There are about twenty billion potentially Earth-like Earth planets. The the reason oh. people say potentially is what you mean there is a rocky planet, mm -hmm. the right distance from its star possibly if everything's right to have liquid water on the surface and so on so we don't know exactly but but yeah rocky planets in a nice distance from the star perhaps one in 10 stars has a has an earth-like planet so, so, in that so sense exoplanet water, something with water on it um is earth an exoplanet is there a distinction no no exo just it just means not in our solar system Oh, not in a... Okay. That's what an exoplanet so, is. So, so we just what's mean the not... definition for a water planet, one that, that's likely to have water? Well, we call them... We, we talk about a thing called a habitable zone around okay. a star. And that's... A, now, in the solar system, there are three planets in the habitable zone. There's Venus, Mars, and Earth. Right. Mm -hmm. Earth in the middle. Venus is close to the sun, Mars further away. All of those planets, though, we think had water at one time right. or another on the surface. Mm -hmm. So they all could have been habitable in that right. sense. Um, and and still, you know, we're looking for life on Mars to this day because we think that it. Why might Why aren't still we looking exist. at Venus for a potential? It, it had a runaway greenhouse effect, um, and it's oh. now the hottest planetary surface in the solar system. It's four hundred and seventy degrees Celsius or something like that on Is the that surface. Predictive in some sense for what we're heading towards. There's a greenhouse effect, so yes. so we think that Venus was probably had oceans, um, maybe you know a couple of billion years ago. Not not you know not just after it formed but maybe for quite some time um it's covered in volcanoes um and what we think is there was a runaway greenhouse effect that turned it from something that could have supported water to something right. that now it will melt lead right on that's the surface. fascinating so the greenhouse effect yeah. does that um, um climate change i mean i just think uh, uh, uh yeah. yeah if there was ever an example is there any way to 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 closer examine venus then given those kind of and I don't know if there's a material. Yeah, we've landed on it. We've la the Russians landed, landed on it. Went... Wow. The, the Russians landed on it in the 80s. Wow. Uh, yeah. So the, the, the Russians have made, I think, at least two successful landings. They didn't last very long, but they took pictures. 
Um, and also we have the, there's a there's a spacecraft. I think there's one called Miguel, and there, there are various spacecraft up there or have been in orbit around Venus that use radar to map the surface. So we, we have maps of Venus. We've seen the volcanoes by bouncing radar off them. The thing is, it's always shrouded in cloud, though. So you never see anything uh, in, in optical right. light. You know, when you take a picture right. of Venus, it's just um, a cloudy thing. Which, which Even in the 50s, you know, I've got these books by... Um, people like Patrick Moore, so real, real astronomers who used to speculate that there might be life on Venus in the 40s, right. 30s. Mm -hmm. it, was, it wasn't until we had radio telescopes that we could see that it was hot. Because again, it's one of those questions. It's a simple question, isn't it? How do you know? Yeah. If you've never how been you there, know? how do you know? Yeah. And, uh, how do you know? So, but, I mean, but you can see it from it. what it radiates. You know, So if you've got a radio telescope, you can see the radiation coming off it. Right. So there's like 20 billion other Earth-like planets. <laughs> Why are we on this one? And surely there'll be another Jack Jones in the universe somewhere. <laughs> well, yeah, I and mean, that's I'm just in the Milky Way, by the way. I mean, it, we're, we're, saying, <laughs> we're saying 20 billion in the Milky Way. There are two trillion galaxies in the observable universe. It's, there's plenty of room, you're right. The, what's interesting is when you talk to astronomers, um, they say things like I've just said. They say, well, we, th we estimate there are 20 billion potentially Earth-like planets out there in our galaxy. Surely there must be life all over the place. Mm. And I would agree with that when you life, right? It's a guess because we haven't found any anywhere. But what we know right. from the history of life on Earth is that life mm. began pretty much as soon as it could here on Earth. So we have good evidence that life was around, let's say, 3.8 billion years ago. And the Earth's mm. only four and a half billion years old. So so pretty much as soon as the Earth had formed and the oceans formed on the Earth, you see evidence right. of life. So that might give you a sense that the origin of life on a planet might have be a high prob high probability, right? Given the right conditions, just because of what we see on Earth. But this is really important. If you then mm -hmm. say, well, when did complex life appear? So not just single cells. Yeah, that's the, just the slime, key definition here. Yeah, but stuff <laughs> that can you know animals and plants and things that can yes. think and make podcasts and you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> the evidence of complex multicellular uh, mm -hmm. living things on Earth goes back, let's say, 600 million years or so, not much further than that. So it's within the last billion. So it, for, on Earth, what happened was that there were single cells, things doing interesting stuff, photosynthesis and things, but from for, for let's say three billion years, from the origin of life, nothing else, not much going on, slime mm, for three mm, billion mm. years. And only yeah. in the last billion, uh, half a billion-ish, right, do you see complex life. So it took about, well, around a third of the age of the universe on Earth to go from the origin of life to a civilization. That's a mm, very yeah. long time. And yes. what you're asking is you're asking that the star was stable and didn't run out of fuel and the, the orbit of the planet was stable. It didn't get hit by too many asteroids. It didn't, another planet didn't hit Whoa. it yeah. during the time, you know, all those things. So it, I think that if you, if you start asking for stability on these mm -hmm. exoplanets uh, for billions of years, if that's what it takes typically to go from the origin of life to something that can think, then mm -hmm. there may be very few places indeed where you see that lowers life. the odds significantly that's, that's yeah. a guess right yes. so it's an educated guess that's my view yeah. though and i think that most biologists i speak to tend to take that view most not okay. all but most so biologists are much more pessimistic right. i find when it comes to complex life than astronomers uh, because they know how what how, what a tortuous path it was right. from mm. from the origin of life to us there's a thing called the eukaryotic cell, right? Which is what we're made of. And every complex living thing on the planet is made of. Every plant, every blade of grass, every insect, everything mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. made of these eukaryotic cells. So it looks like those things evolved once on this planet. Mm -hmm. And it looks like what happened is one type of more primitive cell called mm -hmm. a, a bacteria, in this case, got inside another kind of cell called an archaea, which is still mm -hmm. around now, single cell, got inside and didn't die and somehow managed to multiply like that. Well, right. Yeah, it, it, yeah. And it looks like that happened once 
And it looks like that's the origin of all complex life on Earth. Oh, fascinating. So that it's, is it's, amazing. It's, when you see things like that, which probably yeah. happened about, what, two billion years right. ago or something in some primordial ocean, you think, well, what are the chances? You know, when you start seeing the things that had to happen to make us, yeah. you start to think that this place may be extremely special. And you can make the argument, and I do actually, I think it's very important politically as well, that, that this could be the only planet in our galaxy currently that has anything on it that can think. And your question, your first question, you talked about meaning yep. in the universe, right? Meaning, what is it? It exists because the universe means something to us. So it would be ridiculous to say that we, we don't live in a meaningless universe because meaning self-evidently exists right? because right. we exist. It's a property of us, I would argue. It's a property of human brains, property of thought, consciousness. If we are the only planet currently in the Milky Way where brains exist, where conscious thought exists, we are the only place where meaning exists in a galaxy of 400 billion stars. Now that, I think, is a good working hypothesis. You then ask yourself, should we be treating ourselves and our planet the way that we are? Yeah. Because we are indescribably valuable. <laughs> in that yes. thing. Not, not, notwithstanding our physical insignificance, yeah. it would be astonishing. Imagine if we decide to press the button tomorrow nuclear war right you press the button you the person who does that might wipe out meaning in a galaxy so you believe then let, let, let's put let's put it out there that you believe that it's probably quite unlikely in the milky way and perhaps beyond that there's complex life that we could be pretty damn special yeah that's my okay. guess so i think this leads to another important question let's just let's just squash this myth um, you know, do you believe that um, that we're going to be visited by a UFO and that that um, we're not sure where it's coming from, <laughs> but but you know, it definitely doesn't belong in our orbit. No, I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I would say <laughs> hey, this, hold you know, up, because no, I wouldn't be surprised because the thing is, like we said, the flip side of this is there are loads of planets out there, and there's been loads of time. This, this has got a name. Actually, it's called the Fermi paradox after someone called Enrico Fermi, a great Italian physicist, who asked this very simple question, which is, where are they? Because given the number of planets, given the number of stars, and given the amount of time that there's mm -hmm. been in this galaxy for complex life to emerge, it seems as if at least a few civilizations should have become into, into but what stellar you, civilizations. Right. But what right. you did was made it small. You made the odds even smaller. Or larger, sorry, because of the the nature of a single event. Do yeah, you know I mean? so that would have so part of the evidence, part of the great conundrum here, is that so on on the one side, yes, we've got the history of life on Earth, which says that we took a long time to emerge, and so it looked quite like an unlikely process. On the other side, you've got all this real estate which we're discovering right. every day, mm -hmm. all these places where life could right. emerge, and you have this. So if you think about where we could go. What could we become as a civilization? So already we, we've got, you know, what SpaceX are doing. I think today right. they're launching two Falcon 9s, yes. aren't they? You've got reusable rockets. We are becoming a, a spacefaring civilization now very quickly. So give us, you know, it's not, it's 100 years ago that the Wright brothers <laughs> flew for the first time. Uh, 60 years after that, we went to the moon and now we're becoming a true spacefaring civilization. Give us a thousand years. Give us a thousand mm -hmm. years when we don't destroy ourselves or do anything stupid. We're, I'm sure we're going to be on Mars. We're going to be on the moon. We're going to be thinking about uh -huh. perhaps taking our first steps out to the stars. Give us a million years, one million from now. If we survive, we should be an interstellar mm -hmm. civilization. So we should be the ones that are going out into the galaxy. You would think that. There's nothing in the oh. laws of physics mm -hmm. that says you okay. can't do it. Now, one million years, the galaxy has been around for the age of the universe, 12, 13 billion years. So it only takes a few civilizations to have evolved a bit ahead of us. A million years. Give it, let's say, 10, well, let's say a billion years. A billion years, it's still nothing. You, you get some civilizations that evolved a billion years before us. Why are they not there? Why can't we see them? 
Why haven't they? Maybe they finished already. Well, exactly. So, and and then you, so then people start saying, well, maybe there's a finite life that all civilizations have. Maybe they destroy themselves. Maybe they maybe they don't become spacefaring civilizations. It's Elon Musk's argument, right? But when you ask him why do you want to go to Mars, he says because I don't want the human race yes. to destroy itself. Yes, yes, yes. So it's his central right. argument because you, you can make a very strong argument that we should see the thing. It should be like Star Wars. Right, you should be crawling for with sure. Things. That's fascinating. But what could we get? Do you think in your lifetime, we're similar age, or our kids' lifetime from space? What would you hope to get? I think we'll we'll, we'll have a permanent presence on the moon pretty soon, and Mars within our lifetime. I don't think wow. it's. I, I, my guess is it's not the SpaceX time scale. I think it. I, I imagine it's more twenty thirty. 40 years but I, I could be wrong i mean the the key point from an aerospace perspective as you'll you'll know is that is reusable rockets yes because you know i i remember i've had the pleasure of speaking to um I, i've spoken to all three of those people actually elon musk jeff bezos and richard mm -hmm. branson who are the three leading entrepreneurs i suppose i think it was jeff bezos who said imagine that we set off let's say we're going to fly from london to new york and you fly to New York and you get off the plane in New York and then you blow it up, right? One use, single use, 747s or triple <laughs> sevens <right>. or whatever. <laughs> the, how expensive is that ticket? And that's what obviously we've always done. We don't do that anymore, right? We, we now have low cost, low cost, reliable access to near Earth orbit. Near Earth orbit is already industrialized. It's already an extremely lucrative area to do business in. There are communication satellites, you know, geological satellites that look for raw materials, weather forecast, everything. So it's already industrialized. And now it can be that Jeff Bezos, he said an interesting thing, actually. Um, he said, if you think about Amazon, what I needed to make Amazon was two pieces of infrastructure, the postal service and the Internet. Given that an entrepreneur could move in from his garage initially yeah. <laughs> and build yeah. one of the world's largest companies, um, mm. in space it'll be the same. So, so now you have the infrastructure in orbit. You have the possibility of refueling satellites on orbit, easy access up and down. The entrepreneurs can move in, and they will industrialize that, and that will then spread to the moon, and ultimately in decades to Mars and and, and onwards. So, so I think we'll see all that in our lifetime, certainly the routine use of near earth orbit i think that's coming in a decade is that okay like you know how we're talking about global warming and how as a result of our productivity we're taking up resources is that okay that we're going off to another planet and taking its resources yeah i think it's better isn't it i mean <laughs> jeff, uh, well is, is, uh, like, i mean do we, again do we just chill like I, do we just chill i keep like, i keep quoting you know? jeff, jeff bezos because he is the kind of in some ways he's, he's very eloquent when you speak to him about this um, you see why he built that company, actually, because he thinks very clearly. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, what would you like to do? You'd like to zone the earth, uh, zone the earth residential. Yeah. Love yep. to do that because this is the best planet. <laughs> it's another of his sayings we know of anywhere in the universe. It, obviously, mm -hmm. there's a selection effect. We evolved on it. It is we are made for yeah. it. Right. So mm -hmm. it's the best place for us. But if you want to do heavy industry, ultimately, then you, who cares? Stick it on Mars. Yeah. But I mean, you know, if it's yeah. just a rock, you yeah. can concrete over the thing. You know, I mean, I've been, <laughs> you know, Joni Mitchell, but turn it into a parking lot. <laughs> who cares? Yeah. You know, but I think that I'm kind of being facetious. It's a beautiful place. We don't want to wreck it. But then again, what's the point? I said earlier that I thought that we bring meaning to the local universe. Mm -hmm. So that means to me that the rest of the universe is there. I don't have any problem with going mining asteroids or digging up digging up Mars for raw materials or digging up the moon. Why? Why would anyone have a problem with that? The most remarkable thing that exists in the universe that we know of is us. Totally. And we've got to yeah, come to terms absolutely. with that. We, we can't keep thinking that, you know, you hear people sometimes say the world will be better off without us. That's yeah, bollocks. totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> the world would not be better yeah. off without us. The world would then be like every other world. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. The, there are billions of these yeah. rocks. Uh, what I'm arguing is Literally, there might be very yeah. few yeah. with um yeah. with, with with meaning like on with, them. Listen, I can't sit on this call with the great Brian Cox without talking about D Ream. Like, um, 
you know, we talked about it prior with your extensive keyboard collection and what keyboards you're using. I just find it fascinating that you had a significant success in music. And then I get the impression it still plays a massive part in what you do today because you're putting on like a big musical production and then you're an acclaimed incredible yeah. physicist as well. It's like, wow, what makes Brian Cox tick? So I, I started with a mono synth and just started trying to play keyboards. And to this day, I, I've never had a lesson. So I don't know how mm -hmm. to read music or anything like that. I can read chords. And then um, my dad was in the pub, the local pub, and um, Darren Wharton, who is a keyboard player from Thin Lizzy, was in mm -hmm. the pub. And he'd moved in close to us in, in Oldham. And um, so he gave Darren the demo tape that we'd made when we were 14 or something, which is, of course, whatever. It was very good. But he remembered when he was putting a band together after Lizzy split up that there was a keyboard player up the road and asked me to go and... <laughs> audition Amazing. and what i could do by that point was program stuff so mm -hmm. he needed he needed a programmer as well so i got in so i joined this band with him we got a record deal with AM records this is late 80s loads of money around mm -hmm. you know at the time ended up in los angeles recorded an album uh, in Joni Mitchell's house, oh, actually, wow. with, with wow, Joni amazing. Mitchell's, uh, with Larry That's Klein, amazing. who's a great bass player, who was Joni, married to Joni Mitchell at the time. Then toured with Jimmy Page and Gary Moore and oh, wow. Europe, ultimately, oh, wow. the band Europe. And it, so I had this career with a rock band, left that band because we had a fight, literally, in, in a bar <laughs> <Yeah>. in Berlin, <laughs> uh, applied to go to university. Um, and then during the time I was applying to go to university, I needed a job. And I became a sound engineer. And a friend of mine, a really good friend of mine, had got this band who didn't have a deal called D Ream and said, uh, they, I, and he hated it, right? He hated that kind of music. He was a rock and roll kind of roadie. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so he said, well, you do it. You just drive them around in a car. They, they've got a DAT player and a mic and go to the clubs and set them up and just do it. And you, you'll get 50 quid or whatever. And that's it. <laughs> and it'll keep you going to go to university. And then D Ream got a deal. And didn't have a keyboard player for some TV show that they were doing. So they said, "Oh, you can do that, can't you? Just you, can you just stand there and, and play the keyboards?" So, so I ended up I ended up accidentally joining D Ream while I, while while I was at university, basically on on the way to university. It's so cool. So that's what happened. Yeah. <laughs> that was my brief musical history. Okay. Can we bring all these worlds together? And I'm about to create basically the most exciting proposition that you're going to hear in 2021. Here, here we go. Here we Can go. Can we do the 2021 equivalent of Baz Luhrmann's sunscreen, but with Brian Cox talking about the future, Absolutely. a his monologue, and I'll put some music to it. Uh, I think you got to do it. Put it into the world. I think you got to do it. I'm totally, I'm me, totally yeah. up for that. Yeah. that Completely by the way, Brian, up that's for that. A great, that. That truly is a great offer. That's a, <laughs> Absolutely. This has been insane so much fun brian it's been a pleasure to meet you i loved it really cool conversation it's a fascinating area to talk about well, and we so formed much, a, we yeah. formed a band well, indeed. Well. indeed so that's it <laughs>